Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lottie Nilsson, and I am so glad to welcome you to 100 Years of Women in Politics on behalf of the Jewish Federation of South Palm Beach County. A special welcome to the new faces joining us today, and a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and names. Our Federation Live virtual programs are among the many ways that we have been reaching out to our Jewish community together over the past two months. At the same time, our Federation is also working to meet the needs of the rising critical needs of our people here in Israel and beyond. Through our annual campaign, our Federation's funding for more than 70 partner agencies enables us to respond immediately in times like these. With our Federation's vital support, our agencies on the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis are able to continue, adapt, and increase their care for those most vulnerable in the faces of these unprecedented challenges. Our Federation is at the halfway point of a 30-day community challenge to raise the critical dollars necessary to meet the needs of our annual campaign. Here's the challenge. We have 30 days. 30 days to make sure our seniors are safe and continue to live with dignity. 30 days to give those with special needs the opportunity to live a life full of joy and hope, even during these times. 30 days to ensure that our partners around the world in more than 70 countries can respond to crises like the COVID-19 pandemic that is affecting so many. 30 days so we can say to our brothers and sisters in Israel, we have not forgotten you. You are in our hearts, in our minds, and we will continue to give you our support. Why 30 days? We are going to have to make some very difficult decisions after June 19th if we do not raise the funds we need to keep our community strong. If you are in a position to help, we ask that you go online today to make a gift to our annual campaign. Every donation of any size makes a difference and there are so many people counting on us. After our program, we will email you some information to learn more about us and to help along with additional virtual opportunities to connect. Before we get started, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes. Your microphone is muted for the presentation. In addition, you can adjust the way that your screen appears. If you would like to view the person who is speaking, please select speaker view at the top of the Zoom screen. And if you have questions, you can email them. Now, it is our, my privilege to introduce our speaker, Robert Watson, who really doesn't need much of an introduction. He is a historian, award-winning author, professor, political commentator, and community leader. Dr. Watson has delivered over 2,000 lectures he has led study tours to historical sites around the country and internationally. And he has lectured many times for our Federation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Watson. Thanks, Lottie. Thanks, everyone. I uh, hope everybody's well. Uh, let me again thank Jules and Felice and Aaron, Erica, uh, Lottie, Marissa, the whole crew at the Federation uh, for thinking of all of you. Uh, I consider it a pleasure and an honor to be able to be a part of this and uh, have a long history with the Federation. So I'm very familiar with the remarkable work that they do. So important, and we're seeing that especially now. I'd also like to encourage all of you to check out Congressman Jeffries and our own Ted Deutsch um, are going to be doing a panel uh, tomorrow. And uh, boy, you couldn't have two better uh, public servants. So. Um, uh, thank you for the Federation for that. I'm, I'm already signed up for that as well. Uh, you can skip mine, but don't miss that one. Um, so uh, I'm excited to share with you a fun story. This year is the 100th anniversary of what? The 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. And the story behind it is actually quite interesting. So I'm going to share a screen. I put together some images for you. Uh, here we go. So it should be coming up on your screen right about now. There we are. Okay, cool. So uh, the story of the 19th Amendment. All right. So um, 
it begins with these two ladies here, and that's uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, on the left part of your screen. She was from New York, uh, remarkably well-read woman, uh, smart, tough. I've always been a big fan of hers. And on the right part of your screen is Lucretia Mott, who is from Massachusetts, also remarkably well-read, a uh, Quaker. Uh, both of them came from religious, uh, faith-based traditions, uh, and by our parlance today, they were clearly feminists. Um, and committed to it. So the story of where this uh, push for the 19th Amendment begins is uh, all the way back in 1840. Uh, in 1840, Elizabeth Cady Stanton there on your left had gotten married and they're going to go on a honeymoon. So her husband asks her where she wants to go. And you gotta love it. She wants to go to, get this, she hears that there's an anti-slavery convention in Europe. That's where she wants to go for her honeymoon. My kind of gal. <laughs> So they go all the way to Europe for the anti-slavery convention. And guess what? She gets there and women are not allowed in after all that. So she's outside fuming and another woman shows up and went the whole way there. And that's Miss Mott there on the right side of your screen. She can't get in. So they're outside the convention fuming, planning. We need to create some kind of the similar convention in the United States to give women basic rights the way they were. They were both hardcore abolitionists fighting to end slavery. They said, we need to do the same kind of a thing. There's a break in the convention proceedings. And one of the men who was in the convention comes out and sees the two of them. And he sits down with them. And um, he says he wants to join their effort. He's committed to seeing women get basic rights and the right to vote. Who was that man? None other than Frederick Douglass, the great former slave orator. And Frederick Douglass and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, by the way, would become best buds and they would work together uh, for years. Um, so uh, 1848, they finally got the planning done. They're gonna have a woman's convention in Seneca Falls, New York. And they meet there in July uh, of 1848 at the Wesleyan Chapel. Uh, just over 300 people in attendance. Men were allowed to attend, although during the two-day convention, men were only allowed in the second day. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so at the convention, they have 11 resolutions that they're, that they're putting forward. Uh, the 11th resolution was women getting the right to vote. That was the big one. That was the controversy. The other 10 are things like this. Uh, you know, women at the time could not, in certain states, could not legally divorce. A man had, you know, no fault uh, divorce. They could just say I divorce you, but women couldn't. In some cir circumstances, women could not inherit property, uh, own land, uh, attend a college, get a license to open up a business. Uh, so these are the first 10 resolutions. Also, interestingly, you know, today, if there's a divorce, uh, almost by default, uh, custody rights go to the mother. And that's common today. At the time, however, basically by default, custody rights went to the man. In fact, it was so bad that if a man had died and the family had young children, a lot of times those children would be given to the man's brother or the wife's brother. Um, so one of the things they demanded was custody rights. Um, so the first 10 resolutions were things like that. Business license, the ability to go to college, practice law, divorce, inherit, own land, so forth and so on. So all 10 of those pass unanimously. Then it's time for the 11th. And they sit down and they contemplate it. And there are voices, including Mott contemplated this, maybe we shouldn't introduce the 11th. Because the right to vote was too controversial. It would upset too many men. It would upset uh, preachers. It would upset the southern delegates. So they were worried about it. So they convened, they stepped outside. They also thought, what if they brought it up and it didn't pass? And taking the temperature of the room at the chapel, it was about 50-50. So they step outside, they, they debate it, and Lucretia, I mean, excuse me, Elizabeth Cady Stanton says, nope, we need to do it. Frederick Douglass says, I agree, we need to do it. And the argument was this, you know, it's hard for a woman back then to have any rights if she has uh, one child a year. You know, I mean, think about it. It was not uncommon for a woman to have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 kids and to have multiple miscarriages, uh, infant mortality rates. How do you get involved? How do you have any rights? If you're constantly pregnant, you have a household of young children. 
my maternal grandmother, uh, God bless her, she was one of the toughest people I ever met. She was the oldest of 16. I, I don't even know how that works, <laughs> physiologically or socially. Amazing. Uh, and she basically, well, she went to the fourth grade. That was it. Uh, she basically raised, because their mother died after the 16th was born. She raised her siblings, raised the whole city, helped raise me. Uh, very Today, she'd be uh, a governor, I think. At the time, she was marginally literate, but a uh, remarkable woman. At any rate, so Stanton and Douglas say, for a woman to have any rights, we need the right to vote. We have to pick. Uh, and um, they went inside. And Frederick Douglass gives one of these Martin Luther King-esque speeches that he was known for. Douglass was at the time, you know, it's a shame we don't have any video, everybody, because he was spellbounding. They said he had the, what, you know, like that James Earl Jones baritone. He was very, very dramatic and theatrical. Of course, the look of Douglass, uh, he had a very intense look, was a physically an imposing, very imposing man. Um, and he would do, for example, one of the things, uh, just to give you a, a, an example, if he would be talking about slavery, of course, in a theater or venue back then, you don't have electricity. So there's torches on the walls and lanterns, which give that flickering image. And he had that chiseled face and he would be holding up a lantern as if he was a slave on Harriet Trump Tubman's Underground Railroad. And he would say, yay, even on Mark Twain's beloved Mississippi. I hear the crack of the whip and the shackle of the chain. I mean, using metaphor like MLK, but he would end his speeches by saying, but our movement has, been, has grown too strong to be snuffed out. And then he would put the light out like a lantern and it would be dark on stage. When they would relight the lanterns, he was off the stage. So just very theatrical. So Douglas gives a speech, they call for a vote and guess what? The 11th resolution passes. Um, and the women's right to vote is on the agenda. Now, uh, Stanton and Mott, uh, they use the Declaration of Independence uh, that all men, and they add the line, and women are created equal. And what was cute is they, uh, at the time it was said that women could not get involved in politics because they were too sentimental, too emotional. So they called their declaration, the Declaration of Sentiments. They owned it. Uh, so there we go. Uh, now, unfortunately, in the intervening years, the movement was put on hold because of the Civil War. Um, but Stanton and Mott and a lot of the mothers of the movement said they wanted to earn their stripes. The same way we celebrate the Massachusetts 54th uh, and black soldiers. Lincoln wanted to put black soldiers in uniform. A lot of former slaves said, we want to earn this. We want to fight for this. Frederick Douglass's own sons, by the way, fought. Um, so uh, the mothers of the movement wanted to earn their stripes. So they served uh, in a number of capacities, some as spies, some cut their hair dressed as men and went, you know, undetected as men in camps. And I can't even imagine the hardships. Uh, most of them, however, served as nurses. Now think of this. Uh, I just finished a book on the Civil War. Um, and um, there are descriptions, everyone, of these field hospitals. Uh, you talk about Dante's Inferno, hell. Um, in a primitive day and age of medicine with just 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 casualties in a battle. Uh, these field hospitals, the doctors were just sawing off hands and arms and legs. You know, you had to, in order to save the body, you had to lose the arm or leg. Um, and these women were the nurses that dealt with it. There were descriptions, everybody, of piles of limbs that were five feet high next to the operating table. They would bring a person on the operating table. These nurses had to hold them down. You bit on uh, leather or rawhide. If they had some available, took a shot of alcohol and saw. And then the, they dragged the person off the table, threw a bucket of water on it, put the next one up. Um, can you imagine the conditions that these women served in as nurses? And don't forget, it's not like they went to some college of nursing. This was all on the fly, off the cuff. So they earned their stripes. They also, it was, uh, if you, you know, we didn't have public opinion polls back then, thank goodness, but if we had, Lincoln's biggest base of support would have been among the mothers of the movement. It was the, the women backed by Stanton and Mott who were Lincoln's supporters. They supported Lincoln's efforts at reconstruction, that is physically rebuilding the South 
and ending the kind of horrors that we saw from the KKK, what we would eventually know as Jim Crow. Um, but they were supporters of, and you can see on the screen, I wrote the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. This is Abraham Lincoln's vision for Reconstruction. Tragically, of course, he would live to only see the 13th past. 13th Amendment in 1865 ends slavery. The 14th in 1868 is the Equal Protection Clause. That's the one our current president is trying to get rid of. Uh, the 15th Amendment was in 1870, and that was known as Negro Male Suffrage. In other words, Black men got the right to vote. Now, when it came to the 15th, the women of the movement were completely supportive of all these amendments and were friends of Ulysses Grant, by the way, who uh, was, was remarkably progressive for the time. Grant presides over the 15th. Stanton, however, says, you know, I don't think we should support the 15th Amendment because it should say black men and all women get the right to vote. It doesn't say women, so maybe we shouldn't support it. There's a big debate. And on the one hand, they were lifelong abolitionists who have fought for this moment and they're really not gonna support it. The argument would be if, if we get the right to vote for black men, the right to vote for women will happen right away after that. So reluctantly, Stanton supports it. Black men get the right to vote in 1870. And of course, it would be a full 50 years, a half a century until women got the right to vote uh, after that. So, uh, and of course, none of the mothers of the movement would live, Stanton, Mott and others to see uh, the 19th Amendment get passed. So maybe Stanton was right in terms of their support. They were also, you can see on the screen, they supported uh, not only abolition, but orphanages. Uh, you all know that the state of foster care today is abysmal, especially in Florida, we're one of the worst. Um, but um, imagine back then, you know, you have 600,000 Americans are dead during this war. Hundreds of thousands more amputees, wounded, post-traumatic. Can you imagine the condition for orphans? So it was the mothers of the movement that tried to create orphanages and make sure children were placed in a home. Um, temperance. Uh, this is one of the areas of history I always complain about. Um, you know, uh, not because I want to drink. Well, I'm okay. Partially because of that. But I just don't think history does a good job in the way they teach temperance. Temperance is always portrayed as what? A bunch of fuddy-duddy older women with big hats saying you shouldn't drink. Uh, no, it was Stanton Mott, it was the mothers of the movement who were uh, against temperance. And here's why, domestic violence, rape, child abuse, um, spousal abuse. You know, terms like domestic violence, acquaintance rape, uh, spousal abuse, those terms, that vocabulary didn't even come into play until the 1960s and 70s and the laws followed accordingly. So back then you can't even imagine you know, I've written a number of books, uh, spent my life researching, teaching, and writing on the 1700s and 1800s. Um, we don't know for sure, but my, my guess, and I've said this for 30 years as a professor, is I say one out of every three men back in those two centuries was full on an alcoholic. I mean, face down, drunk around the clock. Also, the instances of spousal abuse, rape, just off the charts. It was just a man's prerogative. So what the mothers of the movement were doing was they were trying to defend spousal abuse and rape. So they were ahead of their times. So they earned their stripes. Moving forward, new leadership. That's um, Susan B. Anthony. You all recognize her. Never been a fan. I was a big fan of Lucy Stone, however. So the movement by the 1869 and the 1870s, it splits. You can see on the screen, we have the National Women's Suffrage Association which is led by Anthony, and you have the American Women's Suffrage Association, which is led by Lucy Stone. The split is over a few things. One, Susan B. Anthony was conservative and her movement, the national, was much more conservative. The Lucy Stone and the American movement was much more progressive, uh, younger, uh, and the big issue was um, family planning. Uh, Susan B. Anthony was against it. She was against abortion rights, basic family planning, and Stone, who was backed, of course, by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, says that, again, how can a woman have any rights if she's constantly pregnant? The basic right in order to exercise our right to vote is to have control over our body. So here we go again today. Um, so Lucy Stone argued for family planning. Um, you know, you've all heard of the uh, Comstock laws in New York. 
back in the 1800s, there was a version of those. And what it said was this, if you are mailing, using the postal service to mail pornography or anything like that, you could be arrested. So in other words, if, if a woman put in the mail literature about family planning, that was considered pornographic and you could be arrested. So Lucy Stone promotes uh, family planning. Anthony does not, which is why today our country celebrates Susan B. Anthony, but forgets Lucy Stone, I might add. Um, so there's a big split in the movement. It's delayed the movement until a big uh, hero of mine. Here she is, Carrie Chapman Cat. Can you see her there on the screen? Carrie, triple C. <laughs> Carrie Chapman Cat was tough. I really like her. Uh, she's the one in 1890 that brought the national and American, the conservative, more progressive, the older, the younger. She brought these movements together. And she said, we need to be on the same page for crying out, out loud. Um, Carrie Chapman Cat also uh, wisely said, one of the reasons we can't get the right to vote, men don't think women are capable. So she got younger women. She trained them uh, public speaking, how to talk to the media, the press, newspapers at the time, and she would have them go give interviews. So newspapers and men's groups would say, wow, women are articulate, uh, you know. Uh, so she did that to try to change the paradigm. Here's the big thing she did. She changed the focus. Instead of trying to get a constitutional amendment, she said, let's go to the states. So, you know, in order to get a constitutional amendment, you need two thirds of the House and Senate and three quarters of the states to ratify. So what she says is it's hard to get a constitutional amendment. We haven't gotten anywhere. Let's go to the states. If we can get one state, a territory even, two or three states, we've got momentum and we know what model works. We can try that nationally. Plus, uh, Chapman Katz said, we're gonna eventually need the states anyway. So that makes a lot of sense, right? To me, it makes a lot of sense. So she said, let's go state by state by state. We can focus our efforts. Brilliant. Now, you would think that she would say the first states we should try are going to be what? New York, Massachusetts, yeah, New Jersey, you're more progressive northern states. She says, no, we're going to go to, the, uh, to Wyoming, <laughs> Colorado, Utah, Idaho, Montana, some of these places weren't even states yet, they were territories. This is where we're going to go. People thought she was mad. Here's why she went there. There were no women in those states and territories, which meant the men there were really, really desperate. <laughs> so she goes to places like Idaho and Colorado and Montana, where there's, you know, 36 women and a couple of 15,000 men. And she says to them, here's the deal. If you give women the right to vote, I will bring lots of women out to your state. Now, the few women that were out there, an, an enterprising entrepreneur uh, from the East Coast would, every fall and spring would get a wagon full of prostitutes and they would ride a wagon full of prostitutes out there and that would be the only women in the area. So men were really desperate. So Chapman Cat meets with them and says, what do you think? I will bring a lot of young women out. And the men said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so she says, okay, give us the right to vote and I'll do it. And they did. And she got the right to vote in places like Montana and Wyoming, these, you know, Western territories, and then Colorado, Utah, Idaho. But then before she signed the paper, here's what she said. Oh, and by the way, we also need the right to divorce, inherit property, own land, child custody rights, practice business, get a law license. And they went, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Now bring the women out. So she got it done. And what she did then is she went back east and she said to women, she said, a lot of younger women, you want to be a lawyer. You want to open up your own business. You want to do, you can't do it. Come out there. They have a business license waiting for you. So women found it easy to do business out there, no competition, and a very willing and desperate <laughs> group of male leaders. So she got it done. How brilliant. So I always love that story. So there we go. Moving forward. Okay. So 1912 was an exciting time because uh, it was a presidential election, and then you'd have the inauguration of 1913. They were excited because in 1912, Woodrow Wilson was running, former professor, uh, president of Princeton University. And he was said that he was a progressive who wanted to finish the agenda of the great Teddy Roosevelt. TR was our president from 1901 to 1909, of course. And Teddy Roosevelt, as you know, was the father of conservation, created uh, second only to Obama. 
and the total number of acres of conservation lands, national parks, wildlife refuges, and so forth. In fact, this first one was down here in South Florida by the uh, Everglades and Keys, a, a bird sanctuary to protect herons and egrets and ibis, all the beautiful birds you see running around our community here in Palm Beach County. Uh, because back then, putting these plumes in women's hats was all the rage. So these birds were going extinct. Teddy Roosevelt saved them. Um, Teddy Roosevelt pushes child labor laws. He pushes a standardized work week after Upton Sinclair's gripping book, The Jungle, describing the horrors of the meat industry. He got meat inspection and food regulations passed. Teddy Roosevelt works with early proto labor unions to give us something really important. It's called the weekend. <laughs> so Teddy Roosevelt pushes all these things um, and we know him for that, but guess what? He pushed two things that didn't come about. He wanted universal health care. Yes, Teddy Roosevelt. And women's right to vote. So with Wilson running in 1912, the mothers of the movement were excited. And Wilson gets elected. Back then, the inauguration was March 4th. Uh, today, it's January 20th. It was moved up in 1937, blah, 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 blah. So the night before the inauguration, March 3rd, 1913, one of the biggest parades in Washington, D.C., and you can see some images here. Women got those big hats. Uh, they had their sashes, not Miss America, suffragette, the right to vote. Uh, they rode horses. Some of them dressed like Amazons with swords and like Viking helmets, and, and it was way over the top. Um, uh, and they had a big parade because they knew with Woodrow Wilson, it would happen. Guess what? Wilson flip-flops and opposes a woman's right to vote. After all that, so close. Uh, but something would happen. Wilson's wife, Ellen Axon Wilson, dies in office in the White House. And Wilson is not only distraught, but he's devastated because he was having affairs on his wife. One of them was with a wealthy woman named Mrs. Peck, who had a, a mansion in uh, Bermuda. And Wilson would go there with her. Congress used to call Wilson Mrs. Peck's bad boy. <laughs> so he was guilty, uh, feeling horrible about it. So he wants to do something to promote women. Plus, he has three daughters at home. So Wilson's thinking about something to, to do to promote women. So guess what gets back on the agenda? A woman's right to vote. Now, something else important happens. Women, Wilson meets a saucy, independent-minded widow named Edith Bowling Galt. Her husband had been a jeweler and left her with a lot of money. And Edith Galt was just something else. And she rocks Wilson's world. Um, the press followed her everywhere, and guess what they would report on? They would see the widow Galt coming out of the White House early in the morning. So juicy scandals. Uh, here's what the press also talked about, the media. Um, now, I know this is the Federation, so we're in hallowed you know, territory. Uh, but is it okay if I tell you what the, what the newspapers, a lot is it okay if I tell everybody what the newspapers said about her? Uh, okay, I'm glad you're all seated out there in your pajamas. So here's what the, the newspaper said. Edith, well, Edith Galt, guess what? She used to drive her own car. That's, that, I'm, that's shocking, am I right? Today she'd be a Kardashian. <laughs> so she drove her own car. Here's what else she did. She went to parties unescorted. You know, women didn't do that at the time. So these were the big scandals. So she rocks Wilson's world. The media follows Wilson and Edith around on their dates. Uh, they would go out and ride a carriage. And one of my favorite typos in the history of newspapers occurs. The Washington newspaper meant to write, quote unquote, the widow Galt, excuse me, the president was again seen entertaining the widow Galt in public, end quote. But there was a typo. And here's what the Washington paper said. The president was again seen entering the widow Galt in public. <laughs> so there's your typo. Um, so Wilson moves with lightning speed, faster than the Boca brisket brigade. I watch, pay attention. And he marries Edith. Now, Edith has conditions for the marriage. Guess what they are? You will support a woman's right to vote. So the mothers of the movement are excited. They know that with Edith on board, here she is telling her husband what to do. <laughs> uh, Wilson has a massive stroke in office, as you all probably know. 
and for about a year doesn't meet with his cabinet or meet with the newspaper, guess who meets with the cabinet and the newspapers? Edith. Guess who meets with Congress? Edith. At the least, she was uh, his regent, as the old word would go, if not an associate president. Um, so with Edith there in 1918, you can see on the screen, the Mothers of the Movement push and Wilson agrees to support a woman's right to vote. So in 1918, it passes the House. Remember, it has to pass the House and Senate with two thirds, but it's two votes shy in the Senate. Two votes shy, close. Now, typically when something fails like this, we wait several years before bringing it back. Um, they say, no, let's move right away. So in 1920, they bring it back. Um, and guess what? It passes the House like that. Passes the Senate like that. Now it goes to the states. So the opponents of a woman's right to vote, uh, Republicans, Christians, Southerners, the opponents of it are panicked. This thing is going to pass. So what they do is they dig in. Uh, massive opposition. So um, they form anti-suffrage associations around the country. They claim that if uh, women get the right to vote, they will no longer marry, there will be no children, and the world will end. <laughs> imagine people overreacting on that side of the aisle. Hard to imagine. <laughs> they lie, they scare, they use fear. It's really, really dicey. You can see uh, here, I put on the screen the big numbers. So um, what happens is the opposition isn't working. Those states out west that Kerry Chapman Cat went after, they ratify. The Northeast ratifies. The whole South, except one state, votes against it. So here we go. We're moving forward. It's close by March of 1920. We have one state remaining, and we're one state short of getting it uh, ratified. Here's the bad news for the suffragettes. It's Tennessee, which is in the South. It's conservative, and it's opposed to it. So the battleground becomes Tennessee. The women suffragettes go to Tennessee. The op opponents, preachers, conservatives, uh, the Republican Party, uh, all go to Tennessee, and it's a battleground. And here's the story. I call it a man, a mother, and a good boy. Okay? Here's the man. You can see a picture of him there. That's James Mann. Uh, he was a congressman from Illinois. The women suffragettes wisely said this issue should be not Democratic or Republican like our issues today shouldn't be. We should transcend parties. So guess what? They wisely got a Republican to introduce it. That's Republican James Mann. He's the one that introduced the 19th Amendment. So there's the man. Let's move on to the mother and the good boy. So we're one state shy. The opposition you can see here, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, they all go to Tennessee. You can see this is the headquarters of the opposition to women's suffrage, and it's getting dicey in Tennessee. So it comes up to a vote in Tennessee. And the vote is a tie. 48 to 48. I mean, what's the likelihood? Since 1840, okay, for decades, it comes down to a tied vote. But after the tie, they realized that one member of the Tennessee legislature was missing. This guy here, Representative Harry T. Byrne, who's only 23. He's the youngest member of the Tennessee legislature, little Harry. Uh, and Harry was at home with his mother. Uh, okay, that's where the mother and the good boy come from. Harry was sick, so he couldn't go vote. And his mother's, if it was a Jewish mother, you know it's matzah, right, and soup. You know, now Harry, you drink your soup, put your scarf on, <laughs> okay? So Harry's at home with his mother. She's nursing him back to health. Uh, so they find out. So everybody rushes to Harry's house, Harry's mother's house. Conservatives are happy because Harry is a conservative who was against women getting the right to vote. He represents a very conservative district. So women's suffrage is done. He's going to go to the Tennessee legislature and vote against it. But his mother, after nursing him back to health, she writes a note, she puts it in his pocket, and she says, now, Harry, you have to be a good boy. And before you vote, you read this note from your mother. Now, what they used to say, the opponents to women's suffrage used to call my girl, Carrie Chapman Cat. they used to call her Mrs. Rat. And they would say they smelled a rat in ratification. You imagine name calling and bullying? Thank goodness it hasn't happened since then. So uh, they smelled a rat 
Uh, so Harry goes to vote. He opens his note and here's what it says. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. And Harry votes to ratify. And the 19th Amendment passes by one vote. There's the good boy. And he listened to his mother. <laughs> okay, so that's the story of the 19th Amendment. I want to quickly talk about 100 years of women in the White House. Uh, excuse the graphics. So real quickly, I'm only, I'll just do four of these. Um, so uh, I interviewed several years ago, uh, I surveyed hundreds of women around the country in elected office, Congress, state, Senate, mayor, city council, school board. Um, and then I interviewed face-to-face -face, uh, or by phone dozens of women in elected office. And I asked them all a simple question. As a woman, what challenges do you face in politics that men wouldn't face? Um, and this is what they told me. The number one challenge that women told me was fundraising. It's harder for women to raise money. Now, I don't mean a $20 check. I mean the big bucks from Soros on the left or the Koch brother on the right, the big bucks. Uh, it's still of, by, and for men. In recent years, we've only had two women that could raise money equivalent to men, Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin. But other than that, women just can't raise the kind of big bucks. You know it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to run for president, tens of millions of dollars to run for Senate, millions of dollars to run for House. So if women can't raise money, they're simply not going to get elected. A woman in the Alabama State Senate, a Republican, I think at the time she was the only woman in the Alabama State Senate. When I asked her, I interviewed her and said, you know, what challenge do you face? And this is what she told me. She goes, oh, that's easy. I don't golf. So I said, well, ma'am, I suggest you start golfing. And what do you mean by that? Here's what she said. Where do you think the money's raised? It's raised in the locker room and I'm legally not allowed to go there. It's raised in the press box of the Alabama Auburn football game. Nobody invites me or on the golf course. I said, well, you need to start golfing. She said, listen, being a state legislator is a part-time job. I have children, I'm married, I have a job. Who has the time to golf, right? What did Mark Twain call golf? A good walk interrupted. <laughs> uh, I don't golf. Uh, I don't golf not because I don't like it. I love athletics. Uh, I don't golf because I don't have an extra hour or two in my days. Um, so if women don't have the time, how are they going to do this, uh, the, the fundraising? This other thing women told me was what's called the second shift syndrome. You can see it here on your screen. The second shift syndrome. Now, I, any married couples out there, I want you to think about this. Surely it doesn't apply to you. But here's what they meant. Even today among two income families, guess who still does 90% of the domestic work? A woman. Child rearing, diaper changing, cooking, sewing, laundry, cleaning, ironing, shopping. Women still do 90%. Um, uh, men uh, uh, come home from their shift nine to five and they what? They sit in their recliner chair, uh, their wife helps them find their glasses and they watch TV and fall asleep. What the women do when they come home from their first shift, nine to five, they start their second shift, which is domesticity. Studies have shown us Cultural anthropologists, sociologists study this. Studies have shown us that the average woman in the United States has you know, a third of the amount of leisure and discretionary time as the average man. And in order to run for office, you need a lot of time. You have to go to Rotary, Kiwanis, go to the club, go play golf. You have to speak to the Federation. <laughs> you have to do a hundred different things, right? Uh, and women simply don't have the time. So until we can change that second shift where men don't have three times as much leisure and discretionary time, until we can make it even, women are not gonna have the opportunity to run for office and therefore not gonna get elected in the same numbers. By the way, a few women told me they also had a third shift, which was taking care of their husbands, okay? Um, the empty nest syndrome, you all know this. Question, when do men run for office? Answer, whenever they want to. Question, when do women run for office? Answer, once the children are raised and out of the household. Now, what that means is women are putting brakes on their ability to run for office. 
and we know that people are marrying later today, having children later today. So if a woman waits to run until her children are out of the household, she's going to be perceived as being too old to run, especially to rise up the ladder in politics. So the empty nest syndrome is yet another problem. Let me just do one more for the sake of time. Uh, studies have suggested, and this is what I talked with women about in, in, that were elected. Hear me out. I don't think this is the right word. Studies suggest that women are less ambitious. Hold on. I don't think that's the right word. Maybe it's women are more cautious, uh, wiser, more realistic, more prudent, have scruples, more ethical. Pick your vocabulary. But here's the point. In studies, this is what we find. This is what I talked uh, with these women in elected office about. Um, question. Men, if you only had a 5% chance of winning, would you still run for office? Answer, of course. Women, question. If you had a 5% chance of winning, would you still run? The majority say no. Question. Men, if you knew you had to take money from unsavory sources to run for office, would you still run? Answer, of course. Women, no, majority say no. Question, if you knew you were gonna be the subject of negative, a camp, negative campaign attacks, you're gonna see these horrible attack ads on TV, and you know and I know that it's all lies, but except for those of us that join Federation events, everybody else in the country believes this crap. Um, if you knew you were going to be the subject of negative attack ads, would you still run? Men, of course. Women, no. So if women are less likely to run, if they don't think they're going to win, they have to raise unsavory money, they could be attacked. The point is, to get elected, you need to be a single-minded seeker of election. Shark on a blood trail. If women have ethics, scruples, and are more realistic, they're simply not going to run in numbers equivalent to men. Therefore, they're not going to get elected. And until we can address all those things, we're not going to make the adequate kind of progress. Let me move this to a close by saying women have been running for president for a long time. So here's your quiz. Uh, by the way, I'm a big fan of hers. Um, the first woman to run for president in American history. Ready? Victoria Woodhull. 1872. Here she is, attractive, smart, young. She was a published author. She taught herself the law, a remarkable woman. However, neither party would allow her to run, so she had to run on a third party as an equal rights ticket. Guess who her vice presidential running mate was? Frederick Douglass. As a favor to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Remember, they were bros, buds. Can you imagine, so Elizabeth, I mean, uh, Victoria Woodhall and Frederick Douglass on a ticket. I used to write a Sunday column for the Sun Sentinel newspaper for a long time. And I did a Sunday TV show for a long time for our local NBC Channel 5, WPTV. And when, when Hillary and Obama were running in 08, a woman and an African American, I remember I wrote my column and did my commentary saying, I can't help but to think that Victoria Woodhull and Frederick Douglass are in heaven looking down saying, what in the hell took you so long? <laughs> so Victoria Woodhull, when she tried to even register to vote, she was arrested. So she couldn't even campaign for herself. Uh, next woman to run, Belva Lockwood in the 1880s. Here she is. She wasn't a serious candidate. She just wanted to run to try to put a woman's name into the agenda. And she was scandalous. She would talk about, I'm not married. And I, I have several men of all different backgrounds and races that live in, with me. <laughs> so she was a Kardashian, basically. Um, so she was scandalous. Then it would take until the year 1964 until another woman ran. And you'll know this person, Margaret Chase Smith. You all, well, no one's old enough to remember 1964, except me. Um, Margaret Chase Smith, first woman to run on a major party ticket, Republican from Maine. She was an amazing woman elected to the House, elected to the Senate. She wrote that one of her big frustrations was this. They would call her male, male opponents, Governor so-and-so, Senator so-and-so. They always called her Mrs. Smith instead of using her title. Uh, then we break the color barrier in 1972. Shirley Chisholm, 1972. I always liked her campaign slogan, unbought and unbossed. Um, Shirley Chisholm ran. Um, I had a chance to interview her 
Um, because she was from New York, that meant what? It meant that she would have to move to Florida in retirement, right? That's a state law in both states. So she moved to Florida. She was in Palm City. And she said two things when I asked about frustrations. She said, number one, black men did not support her. The same men that she marched with in the 60s would not support her because they said the first black that runs must be a man, not a woman. Which leads me to the second thing she said. Therefore, she said, my sex is a bigger obstacle to getting elected than my race. She said, this country will elect a black man before it will elect a white woman. And I went, no way. <laughs> she was right. Um, then in 1984, Geraldine Ferraro, you remember her? A three-term congresswoman from New York, former prosecutor. Ferraro, uh, well, be because she was from New York, that meant she moved to Florida, right? Remember that state law? Uh, so I had a chance to interview her as well. Ferraro was the first woman in history to be picked as vice president on a major party ticket. Walter Mondale, 1984, the Democrat, picked her to be his vice. So I asked her about this, and this is what she told me. She said, I asked her about her big frustration. She said, you know, we have men's issues, like force issues, like military, anti-crime, economics, and we have women's issues, more nurturing issues, like healthcare, children, the environment. She says, as the VP nominee, first woman in history on a major party ticket, she said, I wanted to give my first major speech about a non-woman's issue. So I picked national security. And she said, I gave a kick butt 30 minute speech on national security. And she said, guess what the first question from the media was afterward? What designer are you going to be wearing? Calvin Klein, Halston, I don't know, whatever, whatever. Um, and I said to her, what'd you say? She said, nothing. Because if I answered, I wouldn't look like commander in chief who could be tough and stand up to the Soviets. Back then our presidents used to stand up to the Russians, the Chinese and North Koreans. Uh, I said, and she said, and if I, if I told them to go screw themselves, I would be the word that rhymes with which. Do you remember Barbara Bush used to say Ferraro rhymes with which? So she was damned if she did and damned if she didn't. So Jerry Ferraro. In 1988, Pat Schroeder ran, remember her? From District 1, Colorado. I had a chance of interviewing Schroeder. I've had the great opportunity to interview her multiple times, and we've done uh, maybe a half dozen programs together over the years. She was kind enough to write the foreword uh, for one of my books about electing a woman president, which probably doubled the sales. <laughs> sure wasn't my writing. Um, so I asked Ferrara what frustrated her, and this is what she told me. She said, she organized women's clubs around the country, then ran for president, and yet many of the same clubs she organized said, you know, you're abandoning your maternal responsibilities because you have a little kid at home. She said, my opponent had two kids at home, so isn't he abandoning his paternal responsibilities? And Schroeder's great line, she would always say, what's the problem? I have a womb and a brain and they both work. I should run. So for, uh, Schroeder said she encountered all sorts of opposition. Um, she told me that one time she was at a rally and a woman came up to her, an older woman, and ha reached up and handed her a check. And Schroeder looked and it was only for a couple bucks and the woman wanted to whisper something in her ear. So Schroeder told me she thought the woman was gonna say, sorry, it's only a couple of bucks. Here's what the woman said. Now do something with your hair. So Pat Schroeder told me that sometimes a woman's own worst critic is another woman. That's hard for me as a man and a feminist to say, but that's what Schroeder told me. A woman is sometimes has the toughest opposition from other women. She said, I got grief from women like that. Do something with your hair. Now, no man is ever told that. I have notoriously messy hair. Uh, you know, comb it once a week. <laughs> that's the, my professorial image. Um, but I did shave this morning for all of you, and shave my beard off, um, my COVID beard. But uh, Schroeder said, think about it. Trump has the weirdest hair in the animal kingdom, um, and yet he's president. But women are always talk, told about their hair um, and about their clothing. Um, another woman came up to Schroeder, she told me the story, and handed her a small check and said, do you know that your shoes and your purse don't match? And at the time when Schroeder told me this 20 some years ago, I didn't understand what that meant. I'm married, so now I know that shoes and purses and things have to match, right? So 
uh, women face these kind of challenges. I've been friends with female anchors on TV shows during my long career with the media, and they always say that they get all this hate mail because they gained five pounds or their hair wasn't perfect or they wore the same outfit. You know, men never get that. I have like three dark blazers, three white shirts and three pair of khaki pants. I just rotate them. It's my uniform. And yet nobody says anything to me. But if I wore the same dress twice or three times, uh, people would say something. Schroeder. In 19, uh, excuse me, 2000, Elizabeth Dole, remember her? Liddy Dole, Bob Dole's wife ran. Uh, she had to drop out early. Uh, Carol Mosley Braun, senator from Illinois, ran in 2004. Uh, Hillary, in 2008, almost secured the Democratic nomination. Uh, so that she's the closest anyone came at the time. Sarah Palin, oh, I don't know how this picture got in here. My son must have been messing around with this or my daughter. I'll have to talk to those kids after this lecture. Sarah Palin was the Repub first Republican female vice presidential nominee. Uh, this past election cycle in 2000, here you go, we had six women running. Six. That's a record, everyone. And even though none of them won the nomination, uh, Biden said we'll have a female on the ticket. So we're going to have a, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, it's exciting on the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote that you'll have a woman on the ticket. Uh, just wanted to show you this. All around the world, women, and I'll end here. All around the world, women have been elected to high office, yet not in the United States. Our three closest allies, in my opinion, England, Israel, and Canada have all had women at the helm, yet the United States has not. Uh, Muslim nation, uh, Pakistan, twice had Benazir Bhutto at the helm, had a chance to meet her once, a remarkably smart and attractive woman. She was assassinated. Women in Latin America, women in Africa, in Northern Europe, some countries have had a woman after a woman after a woman. So if you're a 10 year old boy in uh, Scandinavia, you might say to your mom and dad, can a man be the president? Because uh, they've never had one right in their lifetimes. So I think the reason the US hasn't, of course, we're sexist, but there's a deeper explanation. Many of the women around the world that have headed their governments have had direct family ties to the office. Their father or their husband, a brother, a grandfather was the leader. So haven't those direct ties benefited men? It helped John Quincy Adams. It helped George W. Bush. It helped Benjamin Harrison. Men in the United States have always benefited from their dads being in office. So maybe what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And these direct ties will help women. They helped Elizabeth Dole and Hillary Clinton make runs, right? They had direct ties to the presidency. Bob Dole ran and Bill Clinton was president. Uh, one last thought on why women haven't been elected in the United States. Um, around the world, most women leaders have been prime ministers. In the US, it's a presidential system. That's apples and oranges. It's easier to be a prime minister. In a parliamentary system, think of Israel, think of England. All you need to do is win a safe seat and then become the leader of your party. And then if your party wins either a majority or like with Israel with a multi-party complicated system, even a plurality, if you cut a deal and have a plurality, you're the PM. That's easier for women. In the United States, you have to run a two year long, $1 billion, massive nationwide campaign, and that's harder to do. So we haven't quite made it yet in the United States, but in closing, friends, it's not a matter of if, but when we finally elect Madam President. And that's the story of the 19th Amendment and 100 women in office. And I brought it in in 50 minutes. That's a record. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watson. That was fascinating and educational as always. Now we will take uh, questions. Uh, we'll share questions for Dr. Watson until 2.15 for those who would like to stay on. To raise your hand virtually, click on the participants button and then on raise your hands and we, you will be called upon to ask your question. Um, do we have questions? I see Dina uh, raised her hand. I don't have a question. I wanted to thank you for a wonderful presentation. There's a movie called Iron Jawed Women starring Hilary Swank, which talks about a lot of the women that you mentioned. It's a wonderful movie if uh, people have a chance to watch it. Thank you, Dina. Yeah, it's called Iron Jawed Angels. I show it to my students. Uh, it's a wonderful movie. 
uh, which really talks about the suffragettes and some of the struggles that I mentioned to you. So, uh, you know, I'm nerdy when I, when I watch movies, I always kind of fact check them for the historical accuracy. And it's, 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 it's acceptable in my book. It's, it's reasonably accurate. So thank you for that recommendation. I should have said something. Yeah, I show it to my students and it always starts a wonderful conversation. Good. Dr. Watson, I'm gonna jump in for just a moment um, because we're gonna allow you to stay on to answer some questions, but I'm gonna do my wrap up before the rest of the questions. So I wanted to say, say thank you for taking the time to be with us today and to share these important historical question, lessons. I also would like to um, highly recommend that you all join us tomorrow evening at 5.30 p.m. for a conversation on racism, equality, and justice in America with Congressman Ted Deutsch and Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. To register, you can visit us at jewishboca.org slash fedlive. You can also look for additional meaningful ways to connect with our Federation and our Jewish community during these unprecedented times, including how to make a real difference for those in need by contributing to our annual campaign. Together, together with our caring community, we thrive. So thank you. We will continue with the Q&A now but I wanted to say thank you to everybody and thank you to Dr. Watson. Okay, questions. Surely I didn't- Question from Barbara, Barbara Siegel. Okay. Hi, Barbara. Hi, how are you today? I'm okay, yourself? Good, all right. What Good. would you predict would be uh, the running mate for Biden then? <laughs> yeah, uh, I can't. What I can say is he's been saying for a long time now, uh, two things. One, that he would have a woman as VP, and I applaud him, and I think it's the right thing to do, and I'm terribly excited about it. Number two, he's been saying that his cabinet will be comprised of half women and will be the most diverse cabinet in history. You know, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama had remarkably diverse administrations. Uh, regrettably, President Trump has had uh, one of the least diverse administrations in modern history. But um, so it'll be exciting, whether you're a D or an R, no matter where you sit to see this. What I can say, uh, Barbara, is this. Um, for one of the first times in our history, Joe Biden has a deep bench. There are a lot of women that he can call on. Um, you know, we have female governors in, in what, uh, nine states now, I think it is. So uh, from New Mexico to Michigan, there's female governors, which meant that they've had that kind of executive experience. Uh, Kamala Harris in the Senate, uh, Amy Klobuchar in the Senate. Um, uh, you know, a number of, there's uh, 25 women in the Senate now, and the vast majority of them are, are Democratic. Stacey Abrams from Georgia, African-American, ran for governor. Uh, nobody gave her a prayer's chance in Georgia. And, you know, and I'm not being controversial. I put my reputation on it. My guess is she actually got more votes. As you know, her opponent was also the Secretary of State who, um, let's just say this, disenfranchised countless thousands of people in the state of Georgia. So Stacey Abrams uh, was a surprise. Um, either way, what I think, Barbara, is um, Biden will be good to his word. Uh, I also think this will be one of the most important vice presidential selections, maybe since my buddy Harry Truman was picked on FDR's ticket because we find ourselves uh, in a really difficult situation, uh, irrespective of your politics, the COVID crisis, the economy, uh, racism, this country is divided more today as you'll learn tomorrow, more today than any time since the Civil War. Uh, Joe Biden has not aged very well. Uh, I don't think Biden's on top of his game. Uh, he'll probably agree to serve only a single term if he wins. So this will be a very, very important pick uh, to be an active vice president. We've seen recent vice presidents, uh, starting with Walter Mondale, up through Cheney, uh, George Bush one, um, and others uh, have been very, uh, Al Gore uh, and Biden himself have been very, very engaged vice presidents. They're given a portfolio of issues. So I think it's gonna be a very important uh, pick. And I also am excited to see a diverse cabinet, irrespective of your politics. Uh, so thank you for that. Who else has a question? Yeah, I think we have a question from Eileen Feldman. Hi, Eileen. 
Can you hear me, Ms. Feldman? What's your question? I think two of us are trying to unmute her. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hands free. <laughs> There we go. Eileen, did you have a question? All right, let's let's come back to Eileen. Um, Janie Schwartz. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, hi, it's your neighbor. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, if Tom, Tom, Street, Tom Friedman wrote an op-ed piece about a month ago in the New York Times where he felt that whoever the presumptive nominee was for the Democratic Party would do great justice if he selected his team of rivals and gave his suggestions, which included Andrew Yang, Michael Bloomberg, Amy Klobuchar, Pete Buttigieg, in very, very, and Mitt Romney in interesting roles. Do you feel, has anyone ever done that? And how, what do you feel about that? And do you feel that would help him get elected? Absolutely. I'm 100% with you. I've been saying that for a long time now. If I was running Joe Biden's campaign, I would not have him do a single campaign event by himself. I would have Buttigieg, uh, Beto O'Rourke, uh, Klobuchar, uh, Harris, Sanders, Warren. I'd have one, two, three people with me at every single event. I'd also have them canvassing the country, speaking on my behalf. And I would also make sure that they had a role in the administration now. That could be a cabinet role, or given all the crises we face, maybe a czar role, like Beto O'Rourke as czar on gun control, Elizabeth Warren czar on healthcare issue, Kamala Harris czar on racism and the protests, Mayor Pete czar on same-sex equality. Pick, pick your issue. Um, I agree completely, and yes, it has been done. Um, of course, the term team of rivals from Doris Kearns Goodwin's award-winning book on Abraham Lincoln. Remember, Lincoln picked Bates, Chase, Seward, his opponents, his critics, and he picked them for a variety of reasons, uh, not just to keep your enemies close, but he knew that he would need the A-team, the best of the best of the best on board if he could keep this fragile union together during the Civil War. So Lincoln swallowed his pride, was magnanimous, uh, as always, and did that. But he wasn't the only one. George Washington, think about Thomas Jefferson on the far right and Alexander Hamilton on the far left. Uh, he picked the best of the best of the best, including people that didn't get along well. My buddy, Harry Truman. Uh, Truman had Democrats, Republicans, critics, friends, he, he, uh, same thing. So what we've seen with some of the better administrations and cabinets, I'm thinking Teddy Roosevelt to add to that list. I'm thinking JFK to the list. We've seen a real team of rivals. Uh, now, Obama offered three Republicans cabinet positions, which was a record. Only two agreed. You know, so I think Obama gets credit for stepping in the right direction. But uh, yes, I agree with you completely. If I was advising Biden, I would tell him to tap that Democratic uh, uh, candidate pool and make sure that they have some role uh, in it. And again, um, you know, this uh, situation today is bigger than any one person. Uh, and it's, it's going to take us years and years. We've got to be in for the long haul. Um, so you're going to need the best of the best of the best uh, in office, including all perspectives, all backgrounds, all parties. Uh, we're all in this together. So I, yes, I've been saying that for a long time now. So I really appreciate you asking the question. And I hope to see you around the neighborhood. <laughs> I take my daily walks. <laughs> Who else has a question? Anyone else? I'm going to try Eileen Feldman again. Okay. For some reason, I cannot unmute her. How about Alan Newmark? It's Maris. Hi, Hi. how are you? Oh. Oh, hi. Two questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you said that if you were a advisor, have you ever been an advisor like that, that you were saying, you know, as far as Biden's concerned, do you weigh in at all and make your recommendations? Because I also heard that people were complaining that his advertising is very weak and his team that does his public advertising is not a very strong team. Do you ever give your advice? 
question. Uh, so I, ha I have never served, well, no, I've only once in my life served in an official capacity as an advisor, and that was many years ago at the beginning of my career. I was uh, working for a guy who was running for governor of Alabama as a Democrat. Um, I helped write his speeches and things like that. But um, no, I, I do have the great pleasure of knowing several people in elected office. So I do offer my opinions, but not in a formal sense. Uh, most of my work is on boards uh, like the Coolidge Board, the McGovern Board, the Truman Board Foundation, you know, so historical. Um, I do uh, send emails and letters, and I plan to send a number of them uh, uh, about this campaign. I'm not real concerned right now about Biden's advertising and lack thereof. Uh, you hold your fire until you can see the whites of the enemy's eyes, right? Um, it's going to be important in the last two months of the campaign to really push the advertising. What they need to be doing right now is voter registration and looking at the issue of uh, vote by mail, absentee voting, uh, which is going to be critical with the COVID crisis. And the Republicans are outflanking the Democrats on this already. Um, Trump has been saying that it's fraudulent, don't vote by mail, even though he votes by mail. Um, He's opened up a, a number of questions. I'm not being partisan here. I'm being a professor and I'm being factual. Is there a great a degree of fraud in vote by mail? No, never has been, never has been documented. No, 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 it's not true. Um, but Trump has said there is, uh, so he's opening up that front. He's even threatening to cut the post office and limit that ability. And the Republicans are, are, are really beating the Democrats on this front. They have a multi-million dollar budget and they're bringing lawsuits now to try to shut down vote by mail around the country. And the Democrats are simply not ready. So the Democrats need to get their act together. And that's what Biden needs to be focusing on now. That, what he's going to do about the convention, uh, you know, in person or distance, uh, getting people registered to vote. So I'm not worried about that. Biden has two secret weapons. And that is as we get closer, uh, Barack and Michelle will start the campaign aggressively. And when they do, they will bring in hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, get countless thousands of people registered and will energize the base. So I think that's, uh, so I'm not worried yet about, I'm worried about Joe Biden not aging well, um, but uh, I'm not worried about the, the advertising not being where it needs to be quite yet. We still have lots of time. Thank you for that question though. I see you got four folks with their hands raised. Uh, I'm going to call on Ida Nova. Ida? Dr. Watson, thank you for another wonderful presentation. Thank I you. I would love for you to comment on Nancy Pelosi. Oh, lover or hater, regardless of the politics, you know, I'm struck with when you went over about the challenges that women face. She entered politics late. She has five children. And again, whether you're a supporter or not, she's arguably the most powerful women politician in the country right now. Yes, she is. Um, and also, she's emerged lately as one of the best fundraisers, too. So uh, that list of Hillary and Sarah Palin as women who can fundraise equal to men, Pelosi's uh, joined that recently. Uh, so she's a good fundraiser. Now, the difference, though, is Pelosi comes from uh, political stock. You know, the D'Alessandro family, her father, her brother, back in Baltimore. So she comes from a family who were uh, very important politicians, so she grew up with it. She had that kind of institutional backing. Um, uh, I'm mixed on Nancy Pelosi. On the one hand, uh, as a feminist, as the father of a teenage daughter, I love the idea of having a female Speaker of the House. Uh, each one of these situations cracks that glass ceiling. And whether I like or dislike women that ran for president, I love the fact that we've had women in those roles. I've never been a fan. Sarah Palin scares the hell out of me but I was delighted to see a woman as Republican VP, uh, as I was with Ferraro as Democratic VP. So um, uh, I've been very critical of Pelosi in that I don't think she was a very good strategist. Uh, five, six, seven years ago, it seems like she lost every political battle. Uh, the last two, three years, she's done a better job. I think her, her win-loss record has improved dramatically in that She's finally able to win some of these legislative battles. Um, but yeah, so it, it's remarkable to see a woman as, um, 
you know, is one of the most powerful leaders in the United States. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's a very exciting. Thank you. And then we have um, Daryl, it's either Shapiro or Shapiro, depending on where you're from. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, uh, Dr. Watson, uh, I'd like to add to the list of people uh, regarding the team of rivals, what Roosevelt did in the late, late 1930s when he appointed two Republicans as Secretary of Navy and Secretary of War. And I thought that was a, a move of tremendous genius. Uh, we I should agree. comment. Uh, also, uh, uh, Frances Perkins, the first female cabinet officer in history as Secretary of Labor. And boy, she would make a contribution, the 1935 Social Security Act. So yeah, no, FDR belongs to the list. Uh, what you can look at is you can look at Washington, uh, you can look at um, Lincoln, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, Truman, uh, to some extent, John Kennedy. Yeah, so th there's a few presidents that have tried to stack their cabinets with a lot of diversity. Uh, also, uh, and Bill Clinton and Obama to a lesser extent, also uh, looking for the best of the best of the best, you know, the brain trust. Uh, and FDR did, did that as well. Uh, although I wasn't fans of everybody in this cabinet, but thank you. I agree with you completely. Okay, and we have one from Michelle Bleicher. Hi. Uh, I guess I've been unmuted. First of all, let me thank you so much, Dr. Watson. I've seen you and heard you and followed you many, many times, and every time I'm impressed and never disappointed. Thank you. Um, I'll way, send that $25 check that we talked about before the broadcast. <laughs> by the way, I did submit a couple of questions last week. So if we ran out of uh, people raising their hands, there are other questions in the background. Okay, before you ask your question, we can do this, Felice or Jules. You can go ahead and, and forward those to me by email. And we did that in one of my two previous lectures. And um, I answered probably about a dozen of them by email. Uh, so I'll do that again. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. All right, my question, or, or not question, more of a comment, is when we think of Biden, and I sense from you that you're a little concerned about uh, his aging gracefully, or, or in this case, maybe not aging gracefully, but he is our only choice out there. Uh, let's face the way things are going right now. He is our only choice. My question is, is he thinking of a woman because that's the popular feedback that he's getting as opposed to, is this truly going to be the best person out there, man or woman? Is it a woman in his mind or the woman that we're hearing about because he thinks that's going to get him the vote? Okay, good, that's a great question again, thanks. So, you know, let me say this, um, in a democracy, the governing government should look like a lot like the people they govern. So um, we should have a representative democracy. And in our history, we really haven't. The United States Senate does not look like the rest of the United States. And that's a problem in a mature, uh, robust democracy. So by saying I want to put a woman on the ticket, uh, I applaud it for reasons other than looking at who's the best person. Secondly, we can say throughout American history, presidents have not picked the next best, most qualified person to be vice president. Uh, nobody can tell me that the selection of Dan Quayle, uh, that Dan Quayle was ready to be anything beyond dog catcher uh, or mayor. Nobody can tell me Sarah Palin or on the Democratic side, Mr. Eagleton selected in 72 by McGovern. We have not always selected the best person. So there's a long history of picking vice presidents to balance the ticket. If you're from the North, you pick someone from the South. If you're older, you pick someone younger. If you're more of a moderate, pick someone who's more of a hawk. You know, so there's always been that ticket balancing. Uh, very few instances has a president really picked a VP, VP they liked and knew. Harry Truman and FDR didn't know one another. Um, so, um, so what Biden's doing is very much within that. Now, in terms of the best person qualified for the job, Here's what I would say. In previous years, you could say that if you were to announce that you're picking a woman uh, as much of a feminist as I am, I would have said, I'm not sure about that because there were only a handful of woman, women that would have had the political background to qualify them for the position. But today, where you have 25 women in the Senate 
multiple women have been in cabinet positions, multiple women have been governors or lieutenant governors, uh, multiple women have served at the highest ranks of the military. We now have a pool of women whereby you can say I'm picking a woman, woman and not sacrifice the readiness uh, or quality uh, of it. So I would say that in terms of Biden aging, um, I've always liked Joe Biden. I've uh, had the pleasure of meeting him and talking to him. I've always liked him from this respect. Biden's virtues are his vices. He was always one of the few politicians that wasn't on a teleprompter, which meant that every once in a while he said something stupid. But I forgave him that because at least he was real. Uh, and Biden, uh, you know, remember they used to have that poll where they would ask uh, aides that worked for Congress to vote, who's the smartest member of Congress? Who's the dumbest? Who's the nicest? Who's the meanest? Uh, you know, that kind of a thing. Those were always fun. Biden would always be voted the nicest. Everybody in both parties liked the guy. Um, so I still think that's who Joe Biden is. I just think in terms of his alertness and intellectually, he's lost a couple steps. Um, I don't want to anger anybody, but of course he still has my vote because I think the alternative is, is, is alarming. But um, so uh, I support his decision to say I'm picking a woman and to have that diversity because uh, those who govern should represent and look like those that they're governing. So thank you. We have two more questions if we have the time. Um, we're gonna call on Carol Lazarick and then Richard Schwartz. So Carol, you are unmuted. You should Hi, Carol. Hold on one second, there you go. Hi there. Um, speaking of COVID, I was wondering if you were spending this time wisely and writing new books, and if so, what your next book is. Oh, thank you. Uh, you get 25 bucks after the lecture too. So, uh, yeah, so I finished a book on George Washington for Georgetown University Press, and I finished a book on the Civil War for Roman and Littlefield publishers before this COVID. And I was so excited because the one was supposed to be out a month or so ago, and both publish publishers put them on hold, put them on ice. They want to wait and release the books after the COVID. That was frustrating and devastating for me. We had uh, book tours, you know, the National Constitution Center in Philly, the Smithsonian. We had some really great uh, New York City. We had some great book tours scheduled. All that's been flushed. Uh, the books were nominated for some awards and uh, accepted at book festivals. All the book festivals were canceled, so I've been bummed. But yes, I've been spending my time wisely. I already have 104,000 words written. Uh, I have uh, over a 300-page manuscript I put together in the last couple of weeks on uh, the British burning the White House on August 24th, 1814. But it's the story of why they did it, the story of how we functioned without a government, uh, uh, and, and so on. So it's, um, I'm real excited about it. So that book, uh, and Georgetown wants to publish that one. So I, I have pretty much a book ready to go. I just need to, over the rest of the summer to edit it. And then there's a couple of primary sources. You know, fortunately these days, almost everything's online. I was able to uh, obtain over 200 primary sources, diaries and letters from generals and James Madison, uh, all this stuff, newspapers from 1814. I was able to obtain over 200 primary sources sitting in my house by going online. Um, there's a handful I still have to get, however. And I started research for another book. Um, that one's a secret, however. I think I found something that all other historians have missed. So it's a big secret. But I, I've started doing research for that and uh, hope to have that up and running soon as well. So yeah, I've been spending a good uh, 10 hours, 12 hours a day researching and writing uh, and eating and getting fat. So my kids are cooking every day. We do our Watson Family Chopped Contest. My God, my kids are they're, and my wife, they're great cooks. So uh, we, we've been eating like crazy every day. So uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm spending it, I'm putting on a layer of ice of uh, winter protection and and i'll have a whole book done during this crisis thanks for asking carol last question yeah we have richard schwartz okay actually it's going to be janet schwartz hi okay. hi how are you uh thank you dr watson i enjoy your presentations all the time 
I would like to know, do you think it would be better for Joe Biden to be have a virtual campaign with Trump rather than one that they're on the same stage together because of certain things that he does when he's on the stage with somebody else? Do you think that would be better for Biden to have it virtually? Yes and no. Uh, I agree on the virtual. I think, um, you know, Biden used to be a decent debater and his regular, you know, Scranton Joe used to come through and that, that's, that's, that, you know, you can't, you can't buy that kind of coverage. So Biden, I think, used to be a decent debater, a regular guy, but he's not where he used to be. With Trump, it's all about the cult of personality, clearly, by any objective assessment. Uh, Hillary won all three debates against Trump in a, in a going away. However, Trump sucks all the air and oxygen out of the stage, and Hillary was on the defensive. Um, one thing Trump's very good at is going on the offensive. Um, when, when Trump is leaning forward into his punches, he can unnerve and unrattle people unless if they're a very good debater. Hillary's smart as, a t as can be, but she was taken off her game plan, even though she won the debates uh, by that. Biden's not where he used to be, and I could see him stumbling quite a bit. Um, where Trump is really bad is when he's on the defensive. If you can lean into him and get him back on his heels, he's embarrassingly tongue-tied inarticulate, and he lashes out with indefensibly stupid comments. So you have to have someone who can get him on his heels. I don't think Joe Biden today is that particular person. So the virtual could help Biden. Where it would hurt is um, with the COVID crisis, the two secret weapons, Barack and Michelle, uh, whether you like them or not, the two most popular, most effective politicians in the country, if you can unleash them, to crowds of thousands and thousands of people, boy, can you energize the base and bring in the money. So the more this is virtual, the more that undercuts Barack and Michelle Obama's natural charisma and getting them out on the campaign stump. The same way Trump in person can get his base, you know, whipped up into a frenzy and frothing at the mouth. Uh, imagine Ronald Reagan in front of his audiences waving. You know, you wanna get your best uh, the campaigners out in front of people. So it's mixed. The COVID is hurting Barack and Michelle's ability to get out, but I think it's benefiting Biden because he's simply not on top of his game like he used to be. So thanks for that. So I know we said one last question, but we really now have just one very last one. Bruce Zalman, and then um, I'll wrap it up and say thank you again, because there's nothing better than spending an afternoon with you. So thank you. So Bruce Zalman, you're on. Yes, uh, Virginia just recently uh, ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. What is your thoughts that it'll ever come to pass? Good, I'm glad you asked that. So um, the ERA uh, was first introduced in 1921, didn't go anywhere. The big introduction of the Equal Rights Amendment was in the early 1970s, 1971. And they had uh, several years to try to ratify it. Remember two thirds of the House and Senate, three quarters of the states. They were three states shy from being ratified by the end of the 70s. Jimmy Carter was president, uh, as, as you know, 77 to 81. He asked that the ERA be extended uh, through, I think it was 1982. Even with the extension, they could not get enough states to ratify it, so they were still shy. So wouldn't it be something, and what a great way to end this talk, wouldn't it be something if on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, if we would ratify the ERA, now we have some legal quandaries here. For example, we were just three states shy and with Virginia's ratification, we're, we're even closer. But in the intervening years, a couple of conservative states have unratified it. They have voted to say, we no longer want it ratified. So we might have more than two states to go. The high court would have to get involved and say, is it legal, acceptable for those states that did ratify to unratify? And we don't know legally, um, it could go either way. We'd have to have the courts get in. Second, the fact that the ERA's sunset, the number of years we had to get it ratified, that has passed. So the, there could be a legal challenge as to whether or not Virginia and other states that have ratified subsequent to it, whether that's even legal or not. One of the states that hasn't ratified and talk about bringing this full circle is 
Florida. <laughs> Florida has not ratified yet. So if the states that have ratified after the fact, if that would be viewed by the courts as acceptable, and it's a big question whether it was, if the states that have unratified, if that would be thrown out, and that's a big question as well, and we're just a few st two states shy, Florida could push us across the finish line. Now, let me give a shout out to State Senator Lori Berman. Not only is uh, she a friend, but she's someone I think is the real deal. Uh, we are blessed to have people of great integrity and intellect like Lori and Ted Deutsch. And by the way, Lori and Ted, as you know, from a federation perspective, have introduced multiple measures uh, to fight against anti-Semitic violence, to support Israel. So you can't find a better friend to Israel or to the larger Jewish, Jewish diaspora than Lori or Ted. Lori Berman always introduces the ERA and fights for it in Florida. Uh, I'm not optimistic about Florida. I think 12 years in a row now, give or take one year, we've introduced it in Florida, but the, the Republican legislature has defeated it every year. So I don't know why this year would be different, except that it's the 100th anniversary. So yeah, I, I'm upset. I wish uh, as an American, as a father of a daughter, as the husband of a, of a wife, uh, as the brother of a sister, and as the son of a late mother, I wish that we would do this for women. Uh, and uh, it, to me, it's appalling, it's unconscionable, uh, it's indefensible uh, that we haven't. Uh, but legally, I'm not sure at this point it could happen. So thank you. And I wanna thank everybody for the opportunity. Mostly let me thank uh, Felice and her team and Jules and everyone at the Federation for thinking about everybody. It's always a pleasure and an honor, and I mean that. And you all know me, I mean it, uh, to be able to support the Federation and um, if I can be of any service, just say the word, okay? And I wanna thank you, Dr. Watson, for always being so uh, favorable to our community and to everyone here, so thank you. I wanna remind everyone who, the over 200 people who are still listening that we still have about 15 days left of our 30-day challenge. Something to think about. If everyone who is on the call now made an $18 donation, we'd raise probably close over $5,000. So every little bit helps and makes a difference. And I hope I see many of you tomorrow evening at 5.30. So please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call or email or text. Thanks, stay healthy and stay safe. And thank you again, Dr. Watson. Or to Federation, thanks everyone. Bye-bye.